Um, given that I don't see any more questions, um, I would suggest that we go into this mini panel mode for the next 12 minutes. I just need to readjust my timer here. And I do recall that we had one un unanswered question for Basil and two unanswered questions for BIDL. So can we please have Akil Bandarupali promoted so that he can ask a question about the first paper on Basil? Um, um yeah hello can you hear me yes thank you i can hear you do we have a florian still online ah uh, yes i'm here too wonderful go ahead akil um yeah so i had uh, one it was a great talk by the way uh, i had one question like um you specified the uh, osgi 20 byzantine oligarchy paper so uh in the presentation so i was just wondering how does uh, your uh, new safety definition of Byzantine isolation, like uh, if you take the concepts of the oligarchy paper and put it here, like uh, what is the best that Byzantine nodes can do in terms of trying to prevent Byzantine uh, isolation? I, uh, yeah, so thanks for the question. So first of all, there, there's nothing Byzantine nodes can do to violate the isolation. Um, I think what you mean to ask what might be a bigger similarity is actually the Byzantine isolation, but it's this relation between Byzantine oligarchy and Byzantine independence, which is the sort of progress or more general system property that we introduced. The difference here is that in base of, for example, there's no concept of ordering. The idea of Byzantine independence is a strong or more general system property that just talks about um, any influence, right, deciding results. And that includes ordering, but also extends to other things like deciding the outcome of read operations, or in our case, the, the isolation results. But by using quorum in this section, this has no influence on uh, the isolation. So there's nothing they can do to make honest nodes uh, violate Byzantine isolation. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I, I, I'll add to this, there's in particular, which is an interesting point, there's also nothing Byzantine clients can do to violate um, the isolation that the committed transactions that they produce proceed. Um, yes, uh, thank you. That answers my question. Thank you both. I think this, uh, you know, almost approximates the feeling of first speaking in front of three or four hundred people in a large auditorium and then see the people who want to ask you questions line up behind multiple microphones, right? So I'm very pleased with the number of questions we got. So let's go to um, the BIDL paper where we left off with two unanswered questions. Uh, Parth Thakar wanted to ask something. Uh, and we would need uh, Chi, uh, Chi G, of course, online again. So I'm checking here. I see Chi. Uh, and Parth is there. Go ahead, please. Right, so uh, great talk. Thank you uh, for the paper. Uh, I wanted to know uh, how addition of sequencers to the system improves the performance, because I thought that uh, if, if there are just the orderers in the system, uh, then there is one less, uh, you know, path, uh, one less node in the, in the path of the transaction. So how does addition of sequencers improve the um, transaction processing? And is, is sequencer a single node or is it a cluster of nodes? So two questions. Uh, thank you for your question. For the first question, actually the order is very lightweight. The order is just collect, uh, collect transactions, add sequence number for, to the transactions and broadcast the transactions with sequence numbers for all nodes. And, but for the orders, the orders needs to run a BFT consensus protocol, which has three phases. So the, uh, for the order phase is actually much longer. And uh, for why Beetle is uh, faster than existing B uh, workflow uh, for the latency, this is because uh, in Beetle, the execution and the consensus and the BFT consensus run in parallel. So the latency is the maximum of the 
uh, two phases rather than the sum of the two phases. And for the throughput, actually, this is because uh, in Beedle, because we have the, uh, the sequencer to add sequence number to all transactions, uh, so the nodes can execute the transactions according to this, this, this hint order, which can actually uh, resolve the conflicts. So in Beedle's uh, workflow, the validation phase can be very, very lightweight. So we do not need the uh, validation phase, which improves the throughput of Beedle. And for the second question, are the sequencers, are the sequencers a cluster of nodes or a single node? Uh, in Beedle, actually, there is, all, uh, there is at most uh, one honest sequencer at any time. And if the, uh, if the, the sequencer is malicious, actually the Beedle's workflow can detect it and switch to another sequencer candidate. And th the system may have some nodes trying to uh, pretend to be the sequencer and Beedle's denialist protocol can also uh, find these nodes and, uh, and, and achieve high performance. So that's the answer for the two questions. Thank you. It makes sense. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, thank you. So we have uh, Sujanya now who also asked a question for paper number two. So in your experience, um, was ordering the bottleneck or the speculation, uh, speculative execution of uh, transactions and their persistence um, the main bottleneck? And did it differ if you had like normal transactions or if you had majority non-deterministic transactions? Okay, thanks for your question. Uh, your, uh, so for the first question, it, it's about the performance bottleneck of partition blockchains. So in our uh, experience, there are two major performance bottlenecks in blockchains such as HRF. Uh, the first one is a BFT ordering phase. And the second one is a, uh, validation of transactions, which is the last phase. Uh, the, the persistence of transactions cannot be, uh, always it can be performed in an async fashion. So it is not a fundamental problem. Uh, we solved the uh, BFT ordering bottleneck by disseminating all transactions in roughly the same order to all nodes and efficiently by using the IP multi cost. Uh, we solved the validation bottleneck by removing the validate phase by providing all the hints in the execute phase. Uh, currently, a BIDL's major performance bottleneck uh, should still be on the consensus nodes uh, because it, it needs to do a lot of work to receive a large number of transactions. Uh, the non-deterministic transaction, the second question is about the difference uh, between normal transactions and non-deterministic transactions, right? Uh, so the non-deterministic transactions uh, may contain some non-deterministic operations such as uh, the generation of random number or accessing a uh, random uh, memory. So they are, uh, they are the difference. They may have different execution results on different nodes. So that's my answer, thank you. Got it, thanks. Thank you, Sujanya, for, fantastic, for your fantastic questions, of course. Um, so I think uh, we can now go to, well, conceptually to paper three and uh, give word to uh, Shudon, who has a suggestion. Go ahead, please, Shudon. Oh, yeah. So it's not really a question, but I'm just like uh, randomly thinking that uh, it would be interesting to see that uh, whether we can combine the ideas from the three papers like some are like uh, working on building better protocols and some are proposing um, better frameworks. So like say, like, like, I don't know, but maybe we can like use the tree-based dissemination and aggregation in consensus protocol to make it run faster and maybe also parallelize consensus protocol and execution using the sequencer to build a further scalable and performant uh, uh, blockchain system. So <laughs> I don't know what is like your opinions on this, just like uh, some random thoughts. Should I give word maybe? I mean, you know, the OSDI submission deadline is around the corner, <laughs> a month and, and a few days. <laughs> but uh, maybe we give word. Uh, maybe I go uh, with uh, with Florian first. If Florian, if you want to comment, and then we give word to Chi and then to Ray. Uh, can you repeat the, the question? I, I assumed it was meant for the third paper. Oh, yeah. Sorry. It's my bad. You can also see it in the, um, uh, not in the threaded, in the chat. questions but at the very bottom of the day one session yes one second um 
Yes. So I think you could probably combine some tree-based tree aggregation because that just deals with this broadcast pattern, right? Basil uses a star-based pattern that uses the client as coordinator. So typically the state machine replication protocols have the client send transaction requests to a leader at the sequencer then uses a star-based broadcast pattern. Now, what they do is they replace this with this tree-based aggregation scheme. But of course, that's something you could potentially apply to the client as a coordinator if this broadcast or this scheme is your bottleneck. Otherwise, I would say no. Um, I think more, more generally speaking, I, I would say Basil is probably less compatible with other um, techniques that are specifically aimed at state machine replication because it specifically aims to integrate this two-phase distributed commit layer and the replication layer. So um, yeah, it might not be as modular in that sense, but it's quite minimal in the overheads and coordination that it requires. Thank you. Thank you. Chi, uh, do you want to comment on this remark? Uh, I can give some comments. I think actually, yes. uh, actually the uh, the second work and the, the, the algorithm is flowing. That the, the second work and the third work may be more compatible to combine together, uh, because a, a major uh, problem for uh, maybe a major challenge for a bit to be throughout the internet is to. Uh, uh, to to use the bro to broadcast efficiently, and because uh, in in a dedicated network we use a sequencer, and the sequencer can use IP multicast. But in the internet or uh, in the in the network without dedicated cables, actually this can be very inefficient, and that can benefit from the tree based broadcast uh, mechanism from the third paper. And I think if uh, someone tries to combine that works together, actually that can be very beneficial. Uh, yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ray. Yeah, I have to agree with the uh, previous two speakers as well. So yes, I, I believe that with the, cl the client-based approach is probably much less compatible while the um, vital approach could be easily combined. It's probably, aside of that, it would probably be more easily to integrate something like sharding or something similar into then the two approaches rather than a client-based approach because that doesn't need um, the overhead of the state machine replication with the central leader, right? Thank you. Thanks for the great answer. Fantastic. Uh, and, and thank you, Shudon, for this you know, thought-provoking question. Uh, I, I really felt we had a real panel here. So uh, thanks to all our um, attendees, of course, almost 200. Thank you very, very much. And to the presenters. And we take the break now. Thank you. Bye. All right, so we are at the end of the session, um, sessions assigned time. Um, we now have a break or time for a panel discussion. And what I propose that we do is, is we do one or two sort of summarizing questions, bringing all of these papers together, and then we wrap up for a brief break before we go into the next session. Um, so with all the offers here, um, maybe um, Ji and uh, Shusheng, if you can come back on as well. Um, I think you know one really one thing that really stuck out to me in this session is that you know permissioned blockchain systems are you know really the, the hot topic at least as far as BFT and this SOSP is concerned, right? So um, you know all of the, your papers are basically about you know systems that are deployed um, you know in a controlled setting in a permission setting you know perhaps with some between some organizations. So I'm I'm curious about your take on the sort of you know, permissionless, open, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Avalanche style blockchains versus the kind of systems that you're working on. And perhaps whether some of the ideas that you describe in your papers could also be applied in a permissionless setting. Clearly some of them can't be, but, right? But um, is, this, is this work, you know, just focused on permissioned EFT systems or are there lessons that we could draw out into, into the more permissionless world? So should we answer in order? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I think I think for Basel itself, largely because it's sort of integrated with this application of concurrency control. So from the perspective of if you would be using state machine replication and not Basel itself, which is an integrated protocol, the application would be concurrency control. Doing that in a permissionless setting does not sound easily transferable, largely because you usually, in order to bridge this gap, 
um, with subsample committees, like Ray was talking about in his talk, with subsample committees um, from the permission the setting to subsample uh, a small committee in which you run state machine replication. The, the crucial point being, in order to do concurrency control, you need all involved replicas, right? Every possibly subsampled committee at any time to have the state of ongoing transactions in order to not violate serializability. So that's something that would be tricky to do. Right, yeah. that makes sense. Uh, uh, I think I think it's more compatible. Sorry, I'll just quickly with with Avalanche because that's a kind of different style in which you are involving every every node, but doing that in a well in a low lower latency without without incurring this kind of communication bottleneck of all to all. Right, so it's kind of probabilistic in the sense of how it works. All right, two seconds. Uh, for Beetle, I think Beetle has three major components. The first thing is the sequencer. In the permissionless setting, I think we must find a way to build a trusted sequencer around the uh, permissionless nodes because uh, in Beetle, actually, we let the uh, consensus nodes take a round robin way to be the sequencer. And uh, we have the assumption that uh, some of the nodes must be honest, but for the, uh, for the, 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 Permissionless setting, actually, we do not have such assumptions. Maybe we must use some ways like cryptocurrency or some uh, deposit to let nodes to become a sequencer so that it can be trusted. And the second component of Beetle is that Beetle has the uh, parallel execution. I think this way, uh, this can be applied to the permissionless setting as long as we have the uh, trusted sequencer and the sequence numbers, because uh, in that way, uh, the, the in the permissionless setting, maybe the consensus can take more time and we can have a larger block, a larger batch size uh, to further improve the throughput. And for the third component, actually, we have the uh, deny list protocol. Actually, in permission setting, we actually find the clients accounts that collude with the malicious node to, uh, to, to uh, mess up with the sequence numbers. So actually, we deny the clients accounts. But in the permissionless setting, actually, any node can be a client. And so some, we, we may need to adjust the denial list protocol to support the uh, permanent setting. Maybe it should also be uh, uh, linked with the cryptocurrency, like some deposit before a client is uh, trying to, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, trying to make, make up some fork transaction to mess up in the sequence numbers. And another thing is that actually uh, this makes it harder to uh, distinguish right? when some sequence number is messed up whether it is some malicious clients or the, sequence, uh, or the sequencer is malicious. So actually, I think this is also very challenging if we want to operate in Beetle into the permission set. So that's my answer. Thank you. So in, in terms of Kauri, I think we saw like d different uh, depending on the system. So there's like, for example, DPoS systems like Steam, Hive, Tron, et cetera that are kind of achieving a very high throughput because they're choosing smaller committees so that uh, their load is not so high. And these are kind of like, I would call maybe like a thing between a permission system and a permissionless system a little bit. So those would be a system where it wouldn't be very difficult to apply to. In the other regards, we had like an interesting discussion, the discussion in the poster session about it, that there would be like some additional adjustments to incentives in the tree to make sure that there's like no misincentive to make a tree fail to become a leader yourself and maybe get transaction money or if, a, if your leader slow down the system. So there's a bunch of challenges in that regard. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it, it seems like the common theme here, at least between Biddle and Kauri, is that you would need some other currency mechanism or some incentive mechanism, some proof of stake maybe to ensure that you know, people cannot, um, you know, uh, cannot flood the system with sibyls that causes problems or you know, exploit properties of the structured um, consensus in 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 the in Kauri's case to um, become the leader. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
Cool. Thank you for, for answering this question. Um, so before we wrap up, let me ask if any of the authors or indeed, of course, audience members have any questions for anybody on the panel. And I'm particularly excited about the authors asking each other questions because you all work on very similar topics and you know, experts on each other's work. Um, but you know, if anybody in the audience has um, a question of, the, the, of all of the authors, please raise your hand um, and we can have you ask that question or ask it on Slack. So uh, any I, I have one more, I have one more all question. All right, go ahead, please. Oh, okay, I have one more question about Corey. Uh, the trip is dissemination. It may cause higher latency to disseminate the transaction to our nodes, from my understanding, as it needs uh, several intermediate relay nodes to disseminate transactions. Uh, so how to achieve better latency in Cori? Uh, so how, uh, how Cori achieve better latency than for stuff? It's, so, yes, yes, you're a, a good question. So clearly because there are more relay points in the not saturated settings calorie will always have a, a higher latency but the, in exactly in settings where the bandwidth or cpu starts being saturated and then hot stuff is going to pile up transactions um, they're trying to send still because like we already discussed the uh, bandwidth limitation is relatively strong and the bandwidth usage of hot stuff is very high, or it has then transactions piled up because of the CPU usage, then is then at the moment um, we could outperform hot stuff in terms of latency as well. We have described it also, also relatively, we have some additional graphs in that regard in the paper as well. Okay, thanks for your answer. That makes sense. All right, Florian. Yeah, I have a another question for Corey, which is not necessarily super well formed, but given the fact that you're aiming for such large sets of nodes, right, the whole goal is to be scalable. I'm curious, what are, this may be something you've not thought about, what are potential advantages or disadvantages between running Corey, like a tree-based structure, or just running a straight-up gossip protocol instead? The obvious difference being to me that with the gossip protocols, you need to make some kind of some kind of synchrony assumptions. Whereas with uh, the tree-based system, you're obviously waiting for the network speed and the responsiveness. But using a gossip protocol implicitly builds you the optimal tree structure, if you will. It's actually an an interesting question. Also, something that we thought a lot about that when we started this journey, basically. And there's actually a paper about that that's called GoZig that uses Byzantine fault tolerant gossip. But overly, it seems that Byzantine fault tolerant gossip is still something that is relatively complicated. And so it has and a relatively. Too. Hmm? And uh, yes. Yeah. And yeah. yes, that, that in the end um, requires a relatively high message complexity still so like higher message complexity than a tree and aggregation is less obvious as well and pipelining right i i mean i it could require a higher message complexity but i but i don't think it will become the, the message bottleneck what i'm thinking is more the obvious difference is that you need to make some kind of synchrony assumptions that's of course uh, a strong argument the, the, the message complexity one, I'm not sure how much I, I buy into that. I'm also not saying you should run gossip protocols. I'm not a fan of them. This is just a general <laughs> question. Yes, it's, it's, it's something we've, we've considered, but from like what we've gotten from the literature and compared the, the other papers, we, we didn't compare it directly. It might be an interesting experiment to do. But from the additional hops that would be necessary and the additional message, which also then costs additional bandwidth, obviously, um, it would probably perform worse than Corey. All right. All right. Um, thank you guys um, for this awesome discussion. Um, I think we have to wrap up so that we get, give the next session time to start. 
Um, it's great to have you all here. You know, maybe at the next uh, SOSP or OSDI, we can have a paper that combines all of these ideas in the permission blockchain system. So we have you know, transactions with a sequencer and pipelining, um, and then you know, a gossip protocol as well thrown in maybe, um, or not, maybe that's a terrible idea. But um, please uh, feel free to continue the discussion later at the poster session, find the office um, to chat more there. Um, that's it from us from the BFT session. Thank you all for attending um, and we will continue with the bug session in the same Zoom in a couple of minutes. Thanks all um, and thank you to the office. Bye-bye.